There is no cheating death. Sicknesses, physical ailments of other kinds, sadness, even an unwillingness sometimes to think about it are reminders, in fact, of what is inevitable, and that is our own mortality. But we have an almighty Savior named Jesus, and he speaks to the grave and shows his power over death. He accepted its wages, the wages of sin, in our place. He died for us, but then he spoke resurrection promises and rose himself so that the confidence that we can have as Christians, the inheritance that we will receive along with Christ, is a resurrection of the body unto eternal life. And Pastor Paul Zell, Pastor Caleb Kerbis, Vicar Jacob Ungemach, and I serve as pastoral staff at Living Savior Lutheran Church in Asheville and Hendersonville, North Carolina. We always want to invite you to come join us for in-person worship on Sundays. We have two locations. We worship at 930 every Sunday morning at those locations. In the meantime, may the Lord encourage you and comfort you with, this, with the sacred, solid commitment of your Lord to grant a bodily resurrection unto eternal life to all who believe in him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Eternal God and Father, help us to remember Jesus, who obeyed your will and bore the cross for our salvation, that through his anguish, pain, and death, we may receive the forgiveness of sins, victory over the grave, and finally inherit eternal life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first scripture reading, which is also the basis for the devotion, is from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children and if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we also may, may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God, to be revealed. The word of the Lord. So you're telling me that you're uh, a bit tired this morning, feeling a little worn out? That you're hungry? Wish you hadn't skipped breakfast? You're saying that your, your knee kind of hurts, bothers you? cut your thumb, skinned your knee. You're saying, if I'm understanding correctly, that the surgery went okay, but there's still a long, a long way to go. 
What, what if you and I were to do this every day, that every time we gathered together, we would share with one another our ailments? Oh, we, we could do that, couldn't we? In fact, you know, raise your hand and you say, share with the group, this is, this is what's bothering me. Some of them minor, some of them major. Maybe you're saying that you just got the news that a high school classmate was in an accident and is in intensive care that she just heard from a sister-in-law that she has breast cancer and you're concerned about her and about her family. Uh, maybe there's a, an issue that you've dealt with for years and years, but it's getting worse. Uh, we, we can do that as family in Christ, as brothers and sisters, and we actually do it for a number of reasons. We, we can share what our sufferings are with others so that they can help if possible so that they could offer a word of encouragement. And we especially do that so we could, we could bring our sorrows and our pain and our sufferings, we can bring them before the throne of our merciful and, and almighty Father in prayer. We do that a lot, in fact. But I think you've noticed something about those prayers. The Heavenly Father invites all of our prayers for the sake of his son, he listens to every single one of them, but he does not always grant the healing or the help that we ask for. And it's not that he couldn't. Remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, nothing is impossible with God. So whatever the suffering is, whatever the trouble is, whatever the ailment is, the, the Lord could cure that in just an instant, and yet he does not. Because every one of those troubles, every ailment, every hardship, all of our sufferings are day-to-day -day very real reminders that this body and your body as well, is mortal. It's subject to death. We read together from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, and especially this chapter and the three before it, the apostle doesn't allow us to just, I don't want to think about death because he gets us thinking about it. Uh, he doesn't allow us, you know, we, we shouldn't talk about dying because he gets us talking about it. Uh, in fact, we've been talking about it in a number of our worship services lately, uh, reading in, uh, aloud a passage from the letter to the Romans chapter 5. How Paul writes, sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. The apostle puts it more succinctly, in fact, with another famous passage, Romans chapter 6. He writes, the wages of sin, mine, yours included, the wages for that is death. Or today we read if you keep living according to the flesh with its evil desires, you will die and not see God's mercy again. Over the, the four chapters, uh, Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, the apostle mentions death and dying and mortality 48 times so that you and I recognize that this is something we cannot escape something that all those ailments of the body are constantly reminding us, those who are human, who are born in sin into this world, are mortal, will die. The apostle, of course, does not leave it there and neither do this, the scriptures as a whole. In fact, what you and I recognize is that what I've just been speaking of with you is overcome by the work of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So God the Father sent his eternal Son 
to take on a human body so that he in the body could overcome every temptation of the body and never sin and do that in our place. And God sent his son to take on a body so that he could receive in, in our place the wages of our sin and suffer under God's wrath for them. He took on a body, Christ Jesus did, so that he could die in our place and be laid in a tomb. And, wonder of wonders, he took on a body so that God could raise him from the dead and glorify him, make him exceptional in every possible way, and there's more here. So you say, you say that Jesus Christ is the Lord. You say that you believe that he is your one and only Savior from sin and death. The apostle writes, that's the evidence that the Spirit of the Heavenly Father who raised Jesus from the dead the Spirit is living in you, to be able to say that. Or the, or the better known passage, also written by the Apostle Paul, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you and whom you have received from God and the Spirit is not silent. The Spirit is not quiet. In fact, he testifies through the word of Christ and his ambassadors that we're all children of God, every one of us. Children of God who in all of our sufferings and troubles and trials and pains and ailments, children of God who can call on God as our Father, my Father, my dear Abba. And more than that, each one of us is one of God's sons, the firstborn, meaning each one of us inherits. We inherit with Christ the resurrection of the body unto eternal life. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who is living in you. So the body that's raised, the spirit living in you, the body that's raised never again suffers, suffers any pain. No more grief, no more crying, no more death. The body that is raised is raised exceptional, glorified, inheriting what Christ inherited. Centuries ago, people would, they would look up at the, where the stars and the sun and the moon are and they would speculate that the air up there is more pure and more light. And they called that the ether. And then over the centuries, this idea developed, and it's even said among Christians that when a person dies, we immediately go up and we, we live among the stars, which sounds so ethereal. But that's not the Christian faith. The Christian faith that after we've heard more of God's word today that you and I are going to confess is that the mortal body, unless Jesus returns first, the mortal body dies. And at the moment of a person's dying, uh, my soul, your soul, is immediately taken to be with Jesus. No waiting, no limbo, no waiting at all. The soul immediately with Jesus. The body that has died is, is, is laid in a grave or perhaps it's, it's burned to ashes which are buried or scattered. Whatever happens to that body, the Lord God is going to return and he's going to raise the body, mine, yours, 
reunite it with the soul and make it extraordinary. Make it perfect. Make it the way God always intended the body to be. And then, body and soul, glorified, you and I will live all of our eternal days in perfect peace and joy under the new heaven above and the new earth beneath our feet. One of the wonders of being gathered with a family of believers is we confess the faith together. And in a short while, we're going to say that based on the testimony of the Spirit who lives in us because of the words of Christ that have been planted here. You and I are going to have the opportunity to say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. And because I believe in the Holy Spirit who testifies within me as you, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Jesus spoke resurrection certainty in him to his friend Martha. And then he went to the tomb of his friend and her brother Lazarus and spoke his power over death, raising Lazarus from the grave. The Gospel of the Day from St. John, chapter 11. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Jesus, or Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And later, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you, will believe, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Most, if not all of us, have been where, Mar where Martha was. If only Jesus would have been there, if only he would have shown up sooner, then things would have gone totally differently. Maybe it was when you or a loved one were sick and in the hospital, and if only Jesus would have shown up, if only he would have done what you prayed so fervently for, this never would have happened. 
Maybe it was a loved one who passed away and you prayed and prayed and prayed, Lord, just spare their life. And if only he would have showed up. But you know what? It's a really hard truth, a truth nonetheless, but a really hard truth that God's timetable is not ours. Even if we ask it, even if we pray through tears and bruised knees, Lord, please fill in the blank. We've been there with Martha. If only you would have been here. And it seems that sometimes he just doesn't show up when we want, and he doesn't show up how we want. But Jesus had everything to give to Martha in that moment, and you just got to hear it. You see, he wasn't just giving that to Martha, everything that he said and everything that he is. He's also giving that to you and to me as well. The last time you see Martha before this account, do you remember what happened? Mary and Martha welcomed Jesus into the home. Martha, Martha, she's busy. She's not doing anything wrong, but she didn't choose the better thing as Mary is soaking in these words of eternal life from her Savior, and Martha's worried about whether or not she's going to burn the toast, and Mary should get in there to help her. Remember that? She didn't do a bad thing. It's just that Mary chose the better thing. This is still a woman of faith, and you see this in her words. Exemplary as they are, Martha says, I know that he will rise again on the last day. And really, that's all you need. That's all you need. When you stare into the grave that has your name on it, that is all you need. That Martha-like faith, to know that based on everything that you just heard from Romans 8 and everything that Pastor Zell just shared and everything that you see in Jesus here and everything that you know from Sunday school on, or even if this is new to you as an adult, your Savior will raise your body and make you live through death. Physical death is hardly a glimpse compared to what you will experience forever with your Savior who has power over it. He will raise you again on the last day. And that's all that you need. And that's all that you need. And what does Jesus say in response to that? He doesn't just point you to that future reality that will be yours someday. He points you to the very one who gives you that reality every day until that day. What are the next words out of his mouth? I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will never die. That's all you need. When you're not only staring at the grave that has your name on it, but you're staring at the grave of a loved one until you reach your own grave, and you're wondering how it is that you can sit there and smile and cry at the same time as the world looks at you as though you're a fool, as they look at me the same. You can smile and cry at the same sight that should only be sad because the world has no answer to what you and I have an answer to. And that is our Savior is the resurrection and the life. There is no other life found anywhere else. There is no way of cheating death. There's no other answer in all the world, especially in societal norms and in cultural currents that would just rather not talk about this whole awkward death thing. You and I, just like our Savior, can meet it head on. Unafraid to walk right up to the grave of his friend, you and I can stare even at our own tomb and the tombs of loved ones and say, Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. That is the personal benefit that you receive just as Martha received. That is exactly what the power of Jesus' words mean in your life every single day until your final earthly day and your first eternal day. But that power is not just meant to be found in words because just in case people were going to miss that, Jesus had something very personal and powerful to prove. He does what Jesus does, first of all, proving that he is fully human. He is once again deeply moved. The the verse right before that, Jesus wept. He doesn't like death like the rest of us don't like death. Crying over the, the thought, the mere thought of approaching his friend's tomb, Jesus cries, fully human, just as you and I do. He can't stand this, this robber that is death. But he's also not afraid to walk right up to it. This is the kind of savior we have, right? He's not afraid of the mess, the grime, the stench, and the stink. I mean, look at the type of people that he deals with, sinners like you and me, and yet he draws near every single day by his gracious and powerful word. So he's been dead for four days. Open it up. Jesus doesn't care. The same Jesus who will approach lepers when no one else will. The same Jesus who goes to Jairus' upstairs room to raise that little girl saying, Talitha kum. This is the same Jesus who will walk up to any dead person, even that widow of Nain's son, and touch the dead, making him unclean. He does not care because he raises the dead. Open it up. And then what does he say? 
He calls them by name. One commentator said, it's a good thing that Jesus called Lazarus by name. Otherwise, all the dead with an earshot would have come out of the tomb and they would have had quite a mess on their hands. That's fascinating and also fascinatingly true. After all, the one who holds the power over death says what he wants. And even those who are dead can't help but listen as if we would want to do anything else anyways. This is the Savior who calls his friend by name. And he doesn't just call Lazarus by name because he's his friend. And he doesn't just call Lazarus by name because he's the son of God and he knows everybody's name. He calls Lazarus by name for this reason in addition. Because he knows all of his children by name. That's why we get to call our father, father. There's going to be a day when he's going to say over the grave, Paul Zell, come out. He's going to say, Jacob, Ungamak, come out. And that's going to happen. He's going to say, more recently, Dorothy Jasper, come out. Barbara Trexler, come out. Joanne Van Ice, come out. And they're going to come out. I mean, this is the same God who can't do anything but call us by name so that we would be a part of his family. The same God who connects his gracious name, his powerful name and promise to his new little daughters is going to say the same thing to them. Lena, come out. Ellie, come out. And they're going to come out of that tomb unless Jesus comes first. This is the same Savior who not only knows every hair on your head and wrinkle of every fingerprint, but he knows your name. And in the waters of your baptism, he connected you by name to himself, his name, so that you would only always and forever know of one reality, and that is life. Physical death cannot even touch it. It is but a glimpse compared to what your Savior gives to you. So today, until that final day when you actually do see even through closed eyes, that grave that has your name on it, your Savior who knows you by name and called you by name and connected you through the waters of baptism to his triune name will continue to keep you and preserve you and strengthen you as he reminds you of your baptism, as he feeds you with the things that actually were given so that you would have life, his body and blood, as he nourishes you with his word so that you would always and forever know that you belong to your Savior who knows you by name and one day will call you by that name too. And you'll walk out and enjoy eternity. That's not just a comfort for that day to be determined. That's a comfort every single day of your life in between. Amen. If you would like to learn more about Living Savior Lutheran Church, we always invite you to visit our website, lsavior.org. When you go there, you can learn about the, the special worship services are coming up. We're getting closer to Holy Week worship on Palm Sunday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday. You also have opportunity there if you'd like to learn how you can support our ministry with your prayers and, and with your offerings. We're so pleased to have you a, a part of our ministry today, and we pray that you find more opportunities to, to connect with this great work of speaking of a God who so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have in the body eternal life. God bless you.